Representative Bean, I know, has, has filled us in on some of his legislation. But how about each one of you introduce yourself? The people will see you, see who you are, and uh, explain a little bit about some legislations that you have right now. Okay. Well, that was <laughs> All right, I can do that. Um, well, I guess first I'd like to thank you for having us here this evening. It's great to be here. The last time I was here, I think I sat up there and a little bit of a discussion format, which, which was fun, and I appreciate that as well. Awful lot happening at the state level, as you know. We have the state budget that will be coming our way soon, uh, so we're waiting on that. Um, I'm on a couple of committees, uh, Energy and Natural Resources, so doing some work there on issues that affect shoreland protection, water issues, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then I'm chair of the Commerce Committee, which, as you know, has been pretty active and continues to be active. Um, we're meeting twice this week to try to get some bills through. Um, we'll uh, have executive session on Thursday and hopefully send some things to the Senate. Some probably won't make it. Um, sort of bringing it in, in a little bit local for a minute, though, one of the things that, that I've been working on um, is the Coakley Landfill. And Mindy Mesmer has really been taking a good lead on that, and we're backing one another up with help from others. Rennie's a, another um, critical part of that, and, um, and there are many others working as well. But she's put four bills forward. I've co-sponsored three of them. Um, the honest truth is I wanted to be on the fourth. I missed it by 20 minutes, and they wouldn't let me get on it. So I missed the deadline, but I will um, support that should it come through. And then I have my own bill um, on the Senate side that specifically deals with non-natural contaminants that show up in drinking water. And right now, we've got a pretty high EPA standard to cover with things like PFCs. And there are a lot of wells that either have been affected or potentially will be affected at lower levels than the EPA limit. So the DES says, well, you don't get municipal water in that case. What this bill will do is allow wells that test at a level 20% of the EPA limit to be considered for testing at six months and 12 months. There's a 10% increase over that time period in the amount of the contaminant the household is eligible for municipal water and they get off their well. The idea here is to sort of bring down the limit for contaminants that we don't fully understand that are showing up coming out of the Coakley landfill. So the PFCs, 1,4-dioxane, things of that nature. Um, so I'm hopeful we'll be able to get some traction with that. Um, many of the bills that Mindy has put in have been regional in nature, focusing just on, on the seacoast. Mine is statewide. I think we need to move hers to statewide if we're going to get support, particularly in the House, um, or we, we won't get them through. Um, so I, I think we'll be able to get that done. Um, I've been co-sponsoring some bills uh, and, and have a couple of, of my own. Um, Co-sponsor bills on shoreland protection. Uh, student loan assistance, eliminating the statute of limitation on sexual assaults, enrollment eligibility for career and technical ed programs so we can increase the number of students pursuing those programs. Um, we know that a trained workforce is in, in, in short supply, so this ideally will help to support that. Um, some R&D tax credits to encourage companies to invest in R&D here. It's a budget neutral tax credit situation. It's, it's kind of complex. Um, but I think it'll work. And I've co-sponsored a bill to hire more officers for drug interdiction so we can hopefully stop the flow of these drugs into our state and help keep addiction from taking hold. And ideally, that'll, that'll help, uh, help us spend a little less on recovery and help our, our citizens to be in a better place. Um, so we're off to a good start. It's been busy, a lot more coming. Um, and it, you know, we'll keep in mind Hampton and the things that you need, and I hope this evening um, we'll get to hear some of the issues that are that are high on your mind, and understand how we can all help you in Concord. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll talk. I'm Rennie Cushing, and I'm on the Criminal Justice Committee again. And there are a number of issues that relate to criminal justice that I'm been involved with. Um, you know, sponsored legislation to have uh, child pornography recognized for what it is, and that's child sexual assault. Um, there is, a, there is a difference there, and dealing with some of the uh, perceived uh, flaws in our current rape shield law, which I've also been involved in. But I came here to want to talk about bills that I've been part of that directly affect the town of Hampton, not that criminal justice matters don't affect us all. Um, and perhaps the one that I've 
devoted a lot of time to is to try to restore the state's contribution to the retirement of teachers and uh, police and, and firefighters. As people may know, for a half a century, the state of New Hampshire had a partnership uh, going back to 1967 uh, that it would partner with the local cities and towns to support public education. That was seen as a, as a function. In 67, they decided to contribute 40 percent of the retirement cost of teachers to the cities and towns, to the to municipalities. In 1977, they reduced that to 40 percent, from 40 percent to 35 percent, but they also um, expanded it to help uh, with a contribution to police and firefighters. And that, you know, that function for, you know, for three decades, that was the policy that the state would partner with local communities to do that. In 2009, 2010, there was a budget crisis, a financial crisis, so the legislature decided that it was going to temporarily reduce its commitment down to 30 percent um, in 2010. And 25% in 2011, with the assumption that it would return to a 35% contribution. Well, the 2011 legislature decided that it was just going to zero it out completely, and on top of that, it also decided to repeal the law itself. It didn't suspend the law, but it took it off the books. And so what's that, what that has meant um, over the past six years to all cities and towns in the state is about 313 uh, 313 million dollars that has uh, in, that has increased in local property taxes because the state walked away from its promise. Um, I think the municipal association testified on on a bill that I introduced and called it the biggest shock, the worst shock to the communities that they had experienced because they just dropped onto the communities what was the largest single, the, the largest property tax increase in the history of the state. So over the past, uh, you know, past year, I've been working with some stakeholders to try to, to try to come up with a bill that would begin to kind of claw that back to provide some property tax relief to the cities and towns. And working with the municipal association, with you know, law enforcement, firefighter organizations, teachers organizations, and and taxpayers came up with a bill that was introduced. It's House Bill 413. And that would reinstate the state's contribution to <coughs> the cities and towns at 15 percent. Um, I know it's not 35 percent, and I would love it to say that it would be that we could go back to 35 percent. I can count, and I know that that's not going to happen. Um, but what I think 15 percent is doable, uh, according to the <laughs> legislative budget office. It's about 40 million dollars a year, um, and that to me is 40 million dollars of property tax relief. And this, it should be an investment by the state. Um, you know, there's discussions about, you know, everybody pays the property taxes, not just not just homeowners, but also businesses. It's one of the great. It's one of the you know, property tax is a burden to businesses. So, you know, refusing to help out to reduce property taxes, I think, is an anti-business position. Anyway, there was a public hearing last week. Um, I was pleased by the attendance at it. Uh, and the House Executive Department's Administration Committee voted te 10 to 9 to recommend that House Bill 413 ought to pass. Um, that having been said, it's, I, I'm pretty I'm, I'm excited about that. I also realize that we have a long way to go. I would hope that the, every municipality in the state, the town, you know, the, the Board of Selectmen of the City Council, and I know they would be contacting their legislators to say that we need property tax relief. It's you know it's it's time to do this and support House Bill 413. Mm. I've also been supportive of other legislation. I know is supportive of you know Phil has has brought some stuff that we've tried to support that directly affects um, Hampton and other communities. And we're looking forward to revisiting again the uh, the mandated property tax exemption um, that uh, we've had. Discussions with the legislature that cost you know Hampton about 500 million dollars a year. I think the last count. I believe that if the if the if the 15 percent is re I can't remember the number. I think it's at least 600 thousand dollars would come to the town in, you know, in the school district. More than that. More than that. See, I'm being very conservative in my numbers because I don't 
I don't want to say, but I know it would be a significant chunk of change uh, that could help provide some direct property tax relief here in Hampton. One I, sure, I can talk about it. We're going to ask the selectmen to sign a letter tonight, or authorize me to sign a letter tonight to the uh, Speaker and the Governor and the President of the Senate and their uh, majority and minority leaders. Um, we took a, a quick look at what's happened to Hampton since the uh, state's contribution was re was deleted to zero, right. and we've paid approximately one million two hundred thousand dollars in property taxes to supplement that that money that was taken away since it was taken away. Uh, your bill. And the next biennium would uh, add, uh, as far as payments from the state are concerned, it would reduce our contribution to the system for Group 2 employees by $516,896, and for Group 1 employees, $151,902. It's a considerable amount of money. And we're talking the better part of a million dollars here. Right. The taxpayers would not no longer have to pay towards the retirement system because the state would live up to its promises. I also should note just somewhat optimistically that uh, in speaking to members of the Municipal Association, during the uh, the fall, they had the, the governor um, spoke to the Municipal Association and he expressed a, a, an interest or an openness or a willingness to consider some uh, financial aid to cities and towns um, through a restoration of part of the contribution to the retirement costs. It's important. <coughs> when, they, uh, when they actually put that bill in, when that bill originally went in, that was their whole enticement to get the cities and towns to join in to the, <coughs> to the uh, New Hampshire retirement system. You know, because before that, the towns had, to, uh, each one had their own little mm -hmm. pocket. Manchester, I know, still has their own, mm -hmm. their own uh, retirement system, but you know, that, that was their enticement for, to get the cities and towns, the smallest cities and towns, to, to get into the retirement system. That's why they did that. And so it was pretty unfair to the, to the taxpayers when they, when they took that away. And, of course, when they, you know, they broke the promise, they still left in place the mandate. They just said, we're, you know, you're still mandated to be participating in this retirement system. However, we're just not going to help you out like we promised. Right. right. So Can I come in on yeah, yep. it's basically Lucy moving the football, you know. Uh, but before the tar and feathers come out, in finance during budget year, all <laughs> money bills are ITL'd, inexpedient to legislate. But the money can, is going in the budget. I mean, so right. I, when I vote against this, it's because it's a budget item, and in a budget year, that's where you consider it. You don't consider it as a separate bill. So that's a procedural thing. I just want you to, to know that up front before, like I said, the tar and feather comes out that I'm not supporting it. Uh, but the question is going to come down to what else? Do we have the money? Because we haven't got the forecast yet from Ways and Means. And if we do or don't, if we do, everything's ro rosy. But if we don't, the question is what do we not do? You know, do we get rid of the opioid stuff? Do, do we not do this? Do we not do that? I mean, it, it's, it's always a question of, Here's what you got. What are you going to do with what you got? And about 48% of the budget of New Hampshire is Health and Human Services. Which has a $66 million hole suddenly. Right. Well, that's yeah. all of a sudden why here we are. Yeah. Um, but I just, wanted, I just wanted to bring that out before I head out of the comments. I don't want to get into the back and forth. With, but what House Bill 413 does, it, it reestablishes and puts into law the policy. I mean, the problem is... In 2011, they repealed the requirement <coughs> that you had to that there would be a state contribution. Now, granted, it may get to the the, the budget committee may put together, get, you know, come to put together a budget and decide that it wants to maybe suspend the law or reduce that. I mean, that happens all the time in the back of the budget. But what distinguishes that, you know, what distinguishes suspending the law for the alcohol fund or suspending the law for the, you know, state aid grants for, for Suicide Challenge or the state building aid and not funding it, um, those laws are still on the books. So we begin every time a budget cycle starts again. If there's a presumption, if it's the law that the state will make a 15% contribution, that's where the budget uh, starts. starts on. When they removed it, I, you know, in the past years, I've gone to speak to the finance committee and said, well, we don't, you know, the policy was, was done, we, we repealed the policy, so why do we, we don't have to pay attention to it? So I, I, don't, I don't think we can get to the budget till we get to the policy first. That's time will tell.
I do. I agree with them, though. I'm, yeah. I'm not, it's it's logistics. Yeah. You, you know, it, it, it's guilty on both sides of the aisle on this. It was John Lynch that zeroed it out, I remember, and uh, and then they, they repealed it. But it's just one of those things that it was a downshifting to, to local communities. And, and, and when we say, and I know it's budget process, there's no money. Well, the money's got to come from someplace. So the money's going to come from your local taxpayer. That's where it's going to come from, your homeowner. So, you know, the, it, it's, a, it's something that needs to be worked out. It needs to be worked on, and something has to be arrived. I mean, it has to be a partnership between the state and the town, and it has to be a partnership that we work together, not work against each other. That's all I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> so, do you have anything else you want to, before well, we go in, on to other stuff? I'll in, go to in the other guys. In, I'm, I'm on finance, uh, Division One. We handle 35 state agencies or departments. And so far, it's been the 30,000 foot view of here's our department, here's what we do, and here's what our expectations are. The governor's budget, we don't get it for another week and a half, so we don't have any any real dollar things to talk about, and that's all we talk about. Uh, we have had a lot of briefings from economists. Uh, basically, the state's kind of stalled in the growth pattern. We have two and the two and a half percent unemployment, which is approximately 20,000 people in the state are unemployed. Uh, so when we talk about attracting industry, uh, we're not a very attractive state because we don't have enough people. We're just flat running out of people. Uh, and so that it was fairly de depressing, actually. Uh, but I don't. all we can do is help people go get their friends to move to New Hampshire or something. I'm not real sure what the, an what the answer is. Uh, I did, we did have one overview uh, from Judiciary, uh, the Department of Justice, uh, that will affect the town. They are implementing e ticketing and I know everybody's excited about that uh, but what it does is we currently have e-courts and we have small claims court is hundred percent now online and what they're trying to do is get the ticketing process out of the paper world and move it online they're all but they're and they're providing that the cities and towns with the printers that go with the existing systems and I, I don't know all the details here but they it, it's to, apparently no cost to the town to get involved in it so that the, the tickets are issued, they go into the system, and then the hard copy is given to the, to the citizen uh, for process, but the actual processing is now all automated. So that was an interesting item for the town. I don't know if, the, if, you're, if you're involved in it at all at this point, or even know, know that it's coming, but it's... We know it's coming, but we're not involved in it yet. Okay. That's it. Yeah, uh, Mike Edgar. And uh, I'm on uh, Public Works and Total Capital Budget. I haven't seen it yet, so I, I really can't tell you what's in it. But uh, And a lot of people don't really know what's in it right now from the discussions I've had with some people. But um, starting out with, with the Public Works, the first bill that they uh, they had us review was the, the Hampton uh, District Courthouse early on. And they uh, basically said that uh, they, uh, the bill was ITL'd. Uh, uh, basically, uh, in, in <laughs> yeah, I pronounced it right. Basically, it was inexplicable to uh, to legislate, and um, and with vote was seventeen one, and of course I was the one. But the uh, thing about it is, is is that you know Nancy Styles worked on, you know very hard on this, and we had it uh, set up hopefully to be uh, coming to fruition soon. And uh, the word is it there's uh, a possibility it will be delayed. Um, the other groups will uh, get a higher priority and I think that we uh, as a group have to see what we can do to, uh, to you know to fight that or let people know how displeased we are with it I don't know how much good that will do um, when I got elected I did try to look into one of the things that interested me was the uh, meals and rooms tax uh, I know it's a it's a big issue with several on the individuals that are here um, especially mr. Bean and we uh, it was and when I drafted up a, a bill for it, then I got uh, information on what had been done with the commission, and I decided to pull that because it had already been covered the way I was writing uh, by a bill that had been defeated the previous year. But in general, I like to say that I think the local area tax is a way that uh, I would hope that we'd be able to work and push. I know some people aren't in favor of that, but I think uh, being in New Hampshire, being independent, we should be able to do what we want to be able to support ourselves if we're being constrained other ways. Uh, and, and maybe not get enough uh, what we consider to be our fair share of the uh, of the taxes that are being generated by our town, um, and uh, those is that is you know some of the stuff right now that, uh, that I believe it affects us. And there are a couple other issues that 
got I, I know I have to get into more, and I've been trying to, and that's on the building aid. Uh, the way that money is dried up, that affects us directly, um, and it's uh, it, it's you know it, it, it's a big issue for us, uh, especially as we're faced with a a new uh, building right now, and unfortunately uh, with the junior high coming up right away, and the way things are, and the way how fast things move, uh, we probably wouldn't you know it might be difficult for us to be able to take advantage of that uh, if in fact it does get resurrected somehow. But there is a question about money, you know, in the state, and it's. Uh, there's different ways to look at that, and we don't want to get into a, I guess, a political you know debate here. But uh, sometimes when you need things, sometimes you have to pay for them, and there's various ways to pay for them, uh, you know, which uh, which do, do include uh, possibly not cutting taxes in certain ways, so it cuts your stream and also maybe increasing some others. But that's uh, I have to say right now. Rio, yeah. <clears throat> uh, my name is Rio Tilton, and I represent Seabrook, Hampton Falls, and Hampton and I'm on the Fish and Game Committee. And we didn't really have many big bills come through, but we had one big bill that they were saying that was a big one that we had. And it was, they're gonna try to change the Fish and Game Commissioners over to an advisory board. Yeah. Pretty much giving, making it so that the director is a sole person who's in charge. But I don't really think that's gonna go very far, but who knows. Um, I'm on board with many of the things that have been said here tonight with the courthouse and then a few of the Mr. Bean's bills over there. I'm sure he'll explain more about. But um, I started today looking into the fishermen problem because I don't want to be one of the all talk, no action politicians. So I reached out to them today and I'm setting up a meeting with them because I understand a lot of their problems are federal issues, but we're going to see if we can loosen up something in the state side with them. A few of the uh, fishermen have come up and talk to me about certain things. So we're gonna see what we can do, have the commissioner come down and talk with him with the co-op and then the fishermen and see if there's anything we can do to help. Very good. Phil. Thank you. If you don't mind me standing, Mr. Chairman, just for the <laughs> mic, and uh, I'm an old guy, not as young as Rio, and uh, <laughs> I'm a little, little sore. Uh, and I'd like to congratulate Rio on his uh, recent award for one of the up and coming under under 20 uh, legislators. 40 under 40. <laughs> under 40 under 40, yeah, exactly. And um, uh, it's a privilege to represent uh, the people of Hampton, to advance Hampton's interest in the legislative session up in Concord this year. And it's a privilege to work with these fine young men. And it's a team effort, and we don't uh, do that partisan thing up there. And uh, Mr. Cushing has um, set Concord uh, uh, on end with his bill, with 413. And when we speak to this uh, issue of uh, the pension, uh, we're being deprived of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars every year uh, with the pension costs. Uh, Two-thirds of our pension contribution, as we talked about last week, are going to make up for the unfunded liability, which is a direct result of the adverse effects of what Rainey is trying to overthrow. And while there's so much money that is uh, being uh, sucked up in Concord, uh, this group here is, is taking the challenge uh, through myriad legislative efforts. And I'm going to go over a couple that are specific to Hampton. When you're a freshman legislator in the uh, indoctrination period, you're told not to put in any legislation. So I'm very proud of this contingent that they are putting in legislation and, and there are pressures to, to deter uh, men as old as I am uh, and men as young as these youngsters are to uh, put in legislation and, and we're not seeing that. So it crosses both ways <clears throat> and it's more than death by a, a thousand paper cuts up there when you talk about 7098, when you talk about 1198, when you talk about 7712, it is millions and millions and millions of dollars that come from the taxpayers that are sit here tonight that are business owners. They pay the meals and rooms tax. We can't get an accounting for it. Uh, they're taking uh, local rule. They're taking uh, local-based communities, uh, and they're taking it with indifference, and they're taking our money. And it will be interesting how this shakes out with Mr. Cushing's uh, courageous stance and, uh, uh, on 413 and how this comes. It transcends party lines, uh, whether it's the majority or the minority leader. Uh, we represent the people of Hampton, and while Tracy has that, that bulwark to do with finance, and that is the bull committee up there, uh, that, is, that is the nuts and bolts, that's the finance. We know his heart lies with the people of Hampton in this excess taxation. Uh, the legislative bulletin that just came out specifically, it's front page, it's Mr. Cushing. And I just wanted to review a couple of the legislative pieces because I think it's important to deal with. We've harped on these at the local level. I would like to uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Welch, the assessor, 
the town attorney that have gone up there to testify. We've been up there in the past. We've been shut down by young attorneys, some that look as young as Rio, uh, where we have not been allowed to speak at utility rate setting hearings. Uh, we have been before the Senate and have not been allowed to uh, uh, advance our positions. And now we have a, a legislative body that will be aggressive, that will be respectful, that will address the monetary issues of the people of Hampton. And before we clamor for new taxes, is hotel taxes or a, a, an occupancy fee, I think it's our duty to represent taxpayers and business owners and property owners, some that pay tens and tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to make sure we're getting a fair square and representing and pushing the effort and recapturing uh, this denuding and debasement of our tax base and our tax revenue. Uh, HB 302 was a simple one. It was a housekeeping opposition. Mr. Preston wants to get together. Uh, Mr. Nyan has invited me to speak to, uh, or anybody from the delegation, about leasing of the Hampton Beach State Park. Uh, that was presented as a housekeeping issue that would simply study uh, the possibility of Hampton, Hampton Beach uh, Village District, uh, leasing state operations. Nothing more than a study to uh, alter the uh, uh, founding document uh, the, from the HBAC and to codify in legislation that we can study that. A sentiment from a, a committee member uh, uh, is Mr. Bryce uh, protested, uh, I think too loudly, a uh, fine young gentleman that he is, that uh, they were not in favor of a study, which is very unusual for a state employee not to be in, in, in favor of a study. Uh, but we favor that study, I know collectively, to look at uh, the revenues. The committee member who spoke with me in chamber uh, the following day um, said, how can you be against the study? How do you know what type of revenue? And uh, as Tracy has told me in discussions, uh, testimony is the state is not in the business of, of monetizing capital assets. They just don't have that capability, nor should they. That's a private sector. It's a local rule thing. So that has been heard. It is uh, in committee. Relative to the content of fiscal notes, I opined in the uh, Concord Monitor. They published that. We've talked about it here. 1198, which went into effect last year, and the town staff went up to uh, testify, took $175,000. That's on the polls. $175,000. That's only for half the poll. 175,000 from these business owners, 175,000 when we sign um, tax abatements for the blind, for combat veterans, for wounded, for senior citizens. That's 175,000 that they have to pay that the utility company, <coughs> in this case, Fairpoint, um, gets the pocket. And Fairpoint just sold their business. And Fairpoint was, uh, had, had some tough union negotiations for working class men and women in this area and employees that uh, live in Hampton. So that's coming, and I want to be detailed on this because it is detailed, it is a, it is a matter of votes, <clears throat> and it's a matter of legislative effort. So that was the fiscal notes. 1198 said that there was no fiscal impact, and it was indeterminate, both the New Hampshire Municipal Association and the Legislative Services Office. And of course, as we have opined, it's simply not true, and there's no truth in that legislative effort as it was passed. Uh, HB 328 is relative to the public utility infrastructure. Again, uh, 328, I believe, is where the DRA, or is that 324? PUC. PUC, three, 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 they, will, they will start taking, uh, removing local control from tax assessors. They will go to national standards. I believe I have the data that's been produced by the staff. That alone will cost Hampton hundreds of thousands of dollars. It will cost Seabrook millions of dollars. And this is annual tax revenue that again will be legislated away from our tax base. So our taxpayers, our citizens, our students, when we go to build a new high school, we have infrastructure that supports the beach operation down there, uh, $4 million. Uh, we have to make that up. And it's being legislated away in Concord by the legislative body. And then that, uh, Mr. Bean, is uh, yes, sir. 324, you are correct, is going to be heard tomorrow at 10 o'clock in a work session of the uh, science committee of the house thank you thank yeah. you yeah they had they had a rather long hearing about that assessors from around the state including our own uh, testified about that and uh, that is coming up again in front of that committee tomorrow wonderful for thank hampton you. exceed five hundred thousand dollars a year and so, for i think seabrook exceed four million five hundred thousand dollars a year and, and so the public and, and those in the audience can see here uh, a detailed study of the legislative effect with this, the fiscal notes, and uh, uh, this partisan um, uh, uh, effort that, that goes up there. Uh, this is a joint effort. 
this is factual, this is detailed, this is financial management, and somehow it goes out the window up there, and it's what one party leader or another party says, where we, as this collective body, represent both the Seacoast, Seabrook, and the town of Hampton. Uh, the meals and rooms tax, that is going to be heard tomorrow in 202 at 9.30 a.m., or, or on the first, uh, uh, as you were, on the first. That, again, is simply, much like the study of leasing the Hampton uh, Beach, is to quantify how much money comes out of this town for the meals and rooms tax. Because we know the state gets 9%, and we know that that pipe that we have to replace, or, or the voters will, will tell us if we replace it, uh, is that infrastructure that services and enables this state to get 9%. And if we add up all the revenue ploys of the state, it's about $200 million they take up just out of Hampton. And if you go to Portsmouth, it's probably double that. And it's an extraordinary amount of money. And we as legislators, we as leaders, we that represent the taxpayer, need to quantify that. And the state would want to quantify that too, so they can speak to the, the issues that uh, the representative delegation has talked today and said, well, Maybe in this region, there isn't much rooms and meals coming out. Maybe we can legislate or dictate some economic development areas that are hurting and don't enjoy as much revenue as we do. But it also serves as a double-edged sword to exploit and unravel and extrapolate and uncover this hidden tax where we support for the infrastructure, where we provide the operating expenses, the pension expenses, in a very inflationary, exponential way, uh, that burden, and again, it comes out of the tax bill. Um, we've got uh, the exemption for the uh, water and air pollution control facilities. We fought that last year. We got nowhere on it. And I would say, in Concord, that the utilities, uh, with their lobbyists, and they're good men and women, they're getting paid to do a job. They have a, a stranglehold on that legislative process. And uh, if there's any one industry, it is, whether it's 1198 and uh, um, this pollution control uh, costs millions and millions and millions of dollars. So these are the guys that are, that are fighting that effort. Tracy's shaking his head, we're aware of the effort. Uh, Mark's going up, the tax assessor's going up, Mr. Welch is engaged, that letter is great. And how is that going to be delivered? Uh, to the governor and to the uh, House Speaker. And that's going to go certified mail. Certified mail. So that's great. So they actually get hard copy. And we would encourage other communities. Uh, Rio, your Board of Selectmen, and Mr. Ennis, your, the town where you reside and in your district, um, to, to equally be as aggressive and courteous and factual in representing uh, what has been a, uh, a fire hose of uh, uh, water being discharged out of local communities in favor of other people in New Hampshire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions from the board? Gina. Uh, I don't have any questions. I think that you, I'm very happy to see all the bills that you're working on, and they really hit the areas of everything that Hampton and the Seacoast area really need. I do have an additional concern that I would like to take the opportunity, since everyone is here, Mm -hmm. And I would also like to, I talked about it a little last week, but the viewers at home, the public, I would like to get it out. So I apologize. I'm going to be looking at my computer because I don't want to, I want to say it in a certain way. So i like to inform the state reps, the public at home, of an ongoing battle between the town of Hampton, its board of selectmen, its town management, and Aquarian Water Company. Anytime the town has a question, concern, or request from Aquarian, mostly in regards to rate cases and water infrastructure and conserv conservation adjustment, otherwise known as wicker charges. They are dismissed by both the company and the New Hampshire Public Utilities Commission. It is supposed to be the PUC's responsibility to provide efficient services for both the municipalities and the regulated companies. It is not apparent that the PUC complies to this when it comes to Aquarian Water Company and the town of Hampton. And there's other towns that are concerned with the same thing, but I'm gonna just leave it at Hampton right now. Now, I'm an auditor, so what I do is I go in and I try to look at people's information and find things I don't like about it and twist, you know, figure out things that they're saying they're doing and then I try to get ways that they're not doing it. So that's what I'm gonna do. So the following five bullets are taken from the mission statement of the New Hampshire Public Utilities Commission. And I have an argument for each one. Bullet one, to ensure that customers of regulated utilities receive safe, adequate, and reliable services at just and reasonable rates. 
The argument there is there have been tremendous rate increases since beginning in 2006. And you can go in and see that in 2006, the rate was 18.64, 2009, 17.44. And, and then in between rate cases, they pretty much have a wicker, which increases between I don't know, one and 5%, depending on what they decide they wanna do. So the town of Hampton has been in opposition of wicker charges in continual rate cases since 2006. The second bullet, to foster competition where appropriate. What competition? Much like other utilities, there exists only one. Bullet three, provide necessary customer protection. 90% of customers, now this includes 75% in Hampton and 15% in Northampton, have demonstrated concerns and they are continually ignored. Bullet four, provide a thorough but efficient regulatory process that is fair, open, and innovative. Argument. Aquarian refuses to provide the town, its customer, the requested independent audits that the company is subject to, per their attorney, Marsha Brown. Also, it is not evident that the New, New Hampshire PUC conducted a company-specific audit for Aquarian since WICA <coughs> implementation. Penichuk is noted for receiving PUC company-specific audits in regards to WICA charges in both fiscal years 14 and 15. Last bullet, to perform our responsibilities ethically and professionally in a challenging and supportive work environment. Argument, historically, the New Hampshire PUC has always granted the wishes of Aquarian and denied the concerns of the town of Hampton, its customers. Now, it is, I noted, which I did not know this until I started digging into their website, that the commissioners are appointed by the governor and his executive council. Commissioner Robert Scott's term ends in July of 2017. Perhaps this position needs to be replaced with an individual who will actually represent the consumer. It is the Public Utilities Commission, the Public's Utilities Commission, and not the Public Utility Commission. It could be argued that the commissioners are not acting in accordance with their own outlined code of ethics. The general principles of the commissioner's own code of ethics, section 363, colon 12, ethical conduct required, this is what it says, in addition to any type of behavior or activity of a commissioner that is prescribed by RSA 363, a commissioner shall conduct himself and his affairs in accordance with the code of ethics that shall include, but not be limited to, the following elements. And I just did the first two. Number one, avoidance of impropriety and the appearance, appearance of impropriety in all of his activities and two, performance of his duties impartially and diligently. So what exactly am I asking? On page seven of the New, New Hampshire PUC's 2015 biennial report under legislative committee assistance, it states that the commission provides information when asked to the state legislators, primarily through the House Science, Technology and Energy Committee the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and relevant joint legislative oversight committees. In addition, the commission, when asked, participates in legislative studies related to areas within its purview. I would request from our state representatives and state senator that they communicate the town of Hampton's concerns to Governor Sununu and the Executive Council. I would also ask that the commissioners of the New Hampshire PUC through the state senator, state representatives, and via the proper channels to fulfill the requests of the town of Hampton. These can be provided by town council who has diligently kept record of all requests and positions of the town of Hampton. <coughs> As a selectman for 75% of Aquarian New Hampshire customers, I would like it be made known to the public via this meeting's airing, the Hampton Union reporter Max sitting in the audience and any other means of media deemed necessary that is inappropriate for, the, for Aquarian to continually ignore Town of Hampton's data requests and consumer concerns. It is also inappropriate for the PUC to always dismiss the Town of Hampton and its continuous objections to the pancake charges to the customers, to the company's customers, the taxpayer. Thank you. Thank you. Could you email that? I can. That would be great. Yes. Thank you very much for listening. Absolutely. Sorry for reading it, but no, you know. it's good. It's good. <laughs> Regina's been a welcome addition to this board. 
and <laughs> she brings a lot of experience as, as an auditor, and she looks at a lot of that stuff. And, and I know, I know, I appreciate that. I think and the thing, I, same thing could apply to our electric rates. Probably, I could be. We'll put her on that. Whatever one you want. Oh, well, yeah. time, but I'm just saying. The <laughs> same, a couple the same words here and there, we'll be all yeah. set. Yeah. And aren't they due to pound us again on the hydrant rates? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> Is that just a rumor I heard? What's that? The hydrant rates. They're planning on increasing them from seventeen hundred to twenty-one hundred to twenty-five hundred dollars for hydrant. I had a conversation with Henry Fuller in Northampton yep. the other uh, night about that about th that issue and. Um, it's probably a longer conversation than we could start having now, but um, I don't think we're being as well served by the Macquarie Bank, which owns Aquarium. It's hard when decisions made that affect the town of Hampton are getting made in the, you know, in Australia. Right. Well, we 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 had a problem with the fact that during our investigation, that the rates continue to go up. Right. They never pay any of their debt. They always continue to run their debt up and never pay any of it back. They spend uh, eight hundred to nine hundred thousand dollars a year in interest payments, and they supposedly don't have any money left. But mm -hmm. yet they can pay continuously large dividends to their stockholders in, in excess of a million and a quarter dollars a year, which has gone up steadily over the last three or four years. Plus, they can borrow, they can loan three hundred million, uh, three million dollars to their parent company in Connecticut. Right. And there's going to be a lot of money there that's, that's right. being I, siphoned off. And I believe they've been busy acquiring additional franchise areas in Connecticut and wondering where, if they're churning assets in order to help. Connecticut, uh, New York, New Jersey, all those states. I've looked and at so many years of their financials and it's, yeah. it's just numbers on paper. It's a great little Piggy money bank. maker. I, I have to say that the the bill that's before the Science, Technology, and Energy Committee is really dangerous. I mean, I had a conversation with somebody from that committee today who thinks that there's a predisposition that that bill might pass because of Science, Technology, and Energy, and they're used to dealing with the utilities from generators as opposed to had it gone before the municipal and county government, which is much more attuned to uh, the interest of, of communities. And I'm just, I, I appreciate this person's perspective on it. I know what's going to happen, but um, we're going to be in trouble if that bill passes. This 324? Yeah. If 324 passes, the taxpayers of Hampton are going to pick up an additional $500,000 in year one, right. and that cost will continue to escalate until it's well over several million dollars a year that they're going to have to pick up and subsidize in the utility companies. That's a lot of money for nothing. They're taking... This, this happened with the polls. I think Representative Bean said this a few minutes ago. We had we lost $175,000 in year one. The way that uh, this program has been instituted means that we have a unit method of assessment. It's not an assessment that they go out and actually do an assessment on the street like we do for residential and commercial property. They get together and have an agreement, basically. And that agreement says that all of these costs are going to get ratcheted down over the following years, that polls are, which will last for up to 100 years, depending on where they're put, will all be completely depreciated in 30, which means there's no money coming in on them. They sit there and get these polls there for free. The taxes aren't, aren't basically rendered on them. They may come back with a minimum service cost for, for taxes, but it's going to be virtually nothing. So in year one, Hampton loses one hundred and seventy-five to two hundred thousand dollars in year one, and it continues to go up. Well, the utilities got to keep all that money and more. It's just not right. If if you uh, do House Bill three twenty-four this year, which is going to be, according to the latest information, assigned to the ASB as as the poll uh, item was last year, if they have the same result. It's not going to be five hundred thousand dollars a year. It could be closer to a million dollars a year that Hampton has to subsidize. In which case, the cost in Seabrook goes up to over five or six million dollars a year, which will have to come out of the other taxpayers' pockets. You can't keep on doing this. If you do, you'll bankrupt the cities and towns with no problem at all, and the money stays in the utility companies' pockets, not in the citizens' pockets. They just walk away with it. And oddly enough, the telecommunications polls are given this favorable treatment where the same exact poll, which is jointly owned in many cases by the electric utility, is being taxed in the, in the former way. 
And so this, right. it's automatically setting itself up for an equal protection challenge in the courts. The argument has been made by that this standardization of assessment for telecommunications polls is somehow going to settle the lawsuits that have been filed against 140 plus communities, including Hampton. It's not getting rid of that case at all, and it's just giving the right. telecommunications utility a big break. Yeah, if the electric is. industry does, their poles are worth as much as 10 times the value of a telephone pole, the telephone company's property. So it doesn't take much imagination to figure out if the telephone companies are going to make between 150 and 200 thousand dollars a year in Hampton. 10 times that is $2 million a year. That's a lot of money to take off our tax rolls and put on the individual taxpayers' pockets other than the utilities. And you do that multiple statewide, plus the amount the utilities pay for school costs out of the, out of the school assessments issued by the DRA, you're going to have to come up with a lot of money for schools out of the general fund that are now being paid for by the utilities because those monies won't be there. They'll be coming out of the general fund. So if you think you got a, a problem with cash now, just wait. It's going to be really big. Yeah, I want to thank you guys for the, your service. I know you're all getting rich up there in Concord, and I hope we are. <laughs> We've already been paid. They don't yeah, even, it's not even pay for you know, performance. It's paid what up front. Doing with that hundred dollars, right? <laughs> yeah. spending it wildly. <laughs> and uh, Rennie, really good working on those uh, on the retirement issues. I think a great Phil. You got a lot of good ideas. Everybody does. And I think, you know, we've presented that you guys are up there representing the town, but plus working for the state. you got to watch out for both issues, which is very, very important. Uh, but, but you are looking out for the town, and there are some real serious issues that we have to look at with utilities, serious issues to look at with reimbursement, that the money the town takes, the, the state gets out of the town, and then what they give us back. I think that, that has to be an equal... Uh, Thing. And I think our, our past representatives, I know Senator Stiles worked on that constantly. I know the past reps that we've had have worked on that constantly. I've got a couple ideas on it. Yeah. We might so be able to get creative. It, it's a battle up there to keep it going. But thank you for your service and thank you for yes. what you're doing. And uh, don't want to get into the weeds too much. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, thank you for coming in this evening. Um, one of the things that um, <clears throat> concerns Hampton the most is the fact that we have over 1,200 flood insurance policies here in Hampton. And I hope that I'm not really sure where you may be able to offer some assistance or some help uh, or some, you know, that you'll be concerned when these issues break, are brought up because there's a lot of people that pay more money for their flood insurance than they do for their taxes. And it's just amazing for and sure. it affects the value of all property in Hampton. I'm paying it in Newcastle and um, it ain't cheap. Yeah, yeah, so it's not just Hampton, it's the whole seacoast. It is. And uh, many other areas of New Hampshire, I guess. Um, and the other thing I'm concerned about is that everybody keep their eye out uh, for any new government, excuse me, funding that might be coming this way uh, and how it might affect the town of Hampton and the seacoast. Uh, we're all hoping that something like that will happen. So thank you again for uh, all of the issues that you brought up. They're all going to be well worth it, and we're all going to be watching. Thank you. Thank you. Having spent 10 years in Concord as a, as a state rep, uh, I can feel, feel the pain you guys deal with all the time. <laughs> I always used to say it was like herding cats. Um, and it can be difficult, but as, so long as you keep working together, it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you sit on, uh, you have to do that. I worked with Rennie many times up there over various issues. Uh, you're not always going to see eye to eye, but if you, if you remember that you, you, you're dealing with Hampton uh, and, and you need to look at our needs, and we are very different here. We're different probably from any place in the state. You know, I, I think if, if, if Mr. Bean can figure out how much we're paying in rooms and meals tax, you're probably going to see we're probably one of the highest ones in the, in the state for collecting rooms and meals tax. You know, when you look at the state park system, with one of the highest state park gross revenues in the state. When you look at liquor stores, we got the two largest liquor stores in the state. Uh, so we generate, as he stated, a lot of money in this town, and because of that, our services we have to demand more from our from our public works, from our police department, from our fire department. We're using them more and more and more. You know, we look, we've looked at them over the past 10 years. 
we haven't gone up on manpower because we can't afford it. However, that doesn't calls of service haven't gone down over the past 10 years. The number of roads we've put in this town, uh, you know, the calls for the police department, the calls, the amount of septage that we take in. We have the two two sewer lines that where the state is now saying that we have to replace going up um, 101. So, we, we and we know you're all aware of those things, but we just we want to make sure that stays fresh in everybody's mind. That when you come, when you you're looking at Hampton or any of our seacoast towns, that's the stuff we're concerned with. Mr. Beans brought up a lot about the uh, the poles, and Regina's brought up about Aquarian. You know, so, as she said, 75 percent of the, the customers come from Hampton. Well, we still have probably 20 percent of Hampton or 25 percent of Hampton that doesn't even enjoy having water in this town. So uh, when we look at them trying to go to other places first, and they're 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 going bumping right up against being out of water at some points in the summer, you know we're concerned about that so that's some of the concerns we have and uh, we're glad that you came in we, we 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 encourage you guys if you ever have any questions or if you if you need some help on a bill call, call us I mean we have uh, a great staff here we have great department heads uh, if you if you need some information don't hesitate to ask so very good yeah thank you and thank you thank you as, as Phil said you know Everybody on the board and everybody that works for the town has always been incredibly helpful and responsive any time that any of us have needed anything. All right. Deal with this letter. Good one, guys. Thank you. Deal with this letter since ready. Well, while you guys are right here. Where are you? What do you want to say? You want to read the resolution? We're going to read. We have really a resolution. It's not a resolution. It's it's a letter. You want to read it? We've Rennie. got a yeah, yeah. Rennie. Well, Rennie. We, we have a and just you guys yeah. before you leave. We have a let the letter that was mentioned that we're sending. Uh, I'm going to have Fred read that just so you guys can hear it. This regards uh, HB 413, dear Governor Sununu. I'm writing on behest of the Hampton Board of Selectmen to express our strong support for HB 413, which seeks to redress in part. The wrong that was occurred in 2011 when the state legislature eliminated the state's paying any share of the funding for retirement contributions for both Group 1 and Group 2 members. This elimination in Chapter 224, Section 191, effect effectively reduced to zero the state's contribution as of the fiscal year 2013. The legislature originally promised municipalities when the retirement law was enacted in 1967 that the state would contribute a 40% share to reduce their, uh, to induce their participation. This, this share was uh, at, was, excuse me, eroded over time to a point when it was uh, only 25% per year prior to repeal. Municipalities having to bear 100% of the employee contributions towards the state retirements is very expensive ex example of downshifting the cost from the state as uh, has promised to share to municipalities. The reduction of the restoration of 15% uh, is a start in the renewal of that promise. To the town of Hampton, this renewal is very significant. It means a, the state share of $516,896 for Group 2 members and a state share of $151,902 for employees in Group 1 uh, for the next biennium. We understand that notwithstanding ought to pass vote that was taken by the Executive Department's and Administration Committee the House in the House of the House last week, the leadership may be seeking to block even a floor vote this week on this bill. This is appalling to my board, has directed me to write to express how important it is that HB 413 be considered and passed by both houses and for the governor to sign it. Thank you for your attention to this important matter. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Here you go. Just, I just want to get a hard copy. Yeah, yeah. Here you go. Yeah. So you want to take a vote on that to direct? So I'll make a mo uh, I'll take a motion to direct Fred to send that letter. I'll second it. And that will be uh, overnighted return receipt requested registered mail? Yep. Yep. All those in favor? Unanimous. 